Education Part 2, and this is Session 5B. Uh, last week, uh, we went through that timeline uh, for the Apostle Paul. Uh, by the way, if you weren't here last week, there's an addendum in the back if no one told you about that. Um, or, or Milt knows where they are. Anyway, he was passing them out last week. So uh, what we'll do now is we'll um, pick back up right at the end of that. We'll be referring back and forth to some of the things that are in that timeline uh, from time to time. But there you have it uh, to get added to your book. Um, so let's talk about the... Now, th th that timeline originally was given to you so that you could understand some things about the spiritual gifts. The main idea, and this is what you filled in on that note taker, is those spiritual gifts did not begin until Paul began to establish churches. So that's what we did. We traced his first apostolic journey where he began to establish churches and organize them and appoint elders and all that kind of business in 41 A.D. Paul completes the canon of Scripture by writing uh, the, his second epistle to Timothy in 66 A.D. And so that's the span for the spiritual gifts. They were already quite diminishing before Paul writes that last book because as more and more the word is completed, less and less is going to be happening with those spiritual gifts. And of course, when that which is perfect has come, that which was in part, those gifts will be done away. And so the purpose behind uh, those spiritual gifts, and this will take you straight to your note taker, the purpose behind certain of the spiritual gifts was edification. So if you look at the figure one note taker, you'll see uh, concerning the gifts slash offices, we're going to do both of those. The primary goal of those spiritual gifts that you saw listed in Romans chapter 12, verses 6, 7, and 8, because that's where we are. So let me just put it up here. Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8. Those gifts that you see listed there, none of those were signed gifts. These were um, edification gifts. And uh, in the same manner, in the same way that those uh, gifts, I'm turning around to look at the PowerPoint, but it's over there. Uh, in the same way that those gifts were edification, uh, when it comes to the offices, uh, they also are for the edification of the saints. So the, the operation hasn't changed. That's the point that I want to make. And so let me just talk about this, these words for a moment about uh, uh, edify and edification. Uh, I want to I make sure that we're all on the same page about this very quickly. Um, look, because in a moment we're going to read the Oxford English Dictionary definition for edify. And look, there is a sense in which the right thing said to someone at the right time can benefit them or edify them. It doesn't necessarily have to be a spiritual thing. But in the Bible, which is what we're after, there is an edification that takes place in our inner man that is producing godliness. So let's take a look at these. And so... Um, uh, because I don't want you to get the idea that the only thing that can ever edify someone is the doctrine. The only thing that can edify someone unto godliness is the doctrine. But fo folks can benefit by um, a, a good word spoken at a good time. So, so, so there's an edification unto um, the flesh and ed <laughs> edification unto the spirit um, no. okay an education under the why is that thing popping so much okay so um i don't know if i <laughs> understand what you're doing there i'd say there is an edification to the 
general well-being of others, and then there is an edification unto godliness. Mm, um, all of that, um, look, if, uh, let's suppose that someone is having a tough time with something, they're a little bit depressed, and someone comes along and says something, and it lifts their spirit. Um, that's, it's not, I, I'm saying it that way because it's not a ma so much a material thing that you see, but it's happening in their own attitude and mentally. It's, it's what's happening on the inside. And so th that can happen in more than just the doctrine. I, the only reason I'm pointing that is because the definition of the word. Because, Linda? Mike, maybe you could call it, instead of to the flesh, edification to the soul. Yeah, you because could, that would I guess. Be with your mind. Yeah, I guess so. Spirit. You could call it to the soul. That's a, that's a good way to think of it. Okay. <laughs> or the heart. Yes. Um, so what I'm saying, you understand that when someone is built, gets built up, the edify, that root word is edifice. It's a building. Well, an, a, a, pro, a process of edification is a building up. But what is it a building up of? It's a building up of something in you. The doctrine is the only thing that can produce godliness. But, um, you know, the lost world does this all the time, you know, to uh, help someone. Uh, this is what um, secular counselors try to do. They try to lift the spirits of people and encourage them and, and those kinds of things. So what I want to do now is hone in on this one defin on, the, on the definition that we're after. So here it is, edify. In religious use, and by the way, this is part of the Oxford English Dictionary saying this. And this is not my addition. In religious use, to build up the church, the soul. They're giving you some examples there. In faith and holiness, to benefit spiritually, to strengthen and support. Well, look, if you were looking at the other definitions of edify, you would find out that in a non-religious sense, it, it, would, it would mean basically the same thing. To strengthen someone, to support someone, that they would benefit by something that was said to them. Okay. Now, take a look at edification. The building up of the church of the soul in faith and holiness. The imparting of moral and spiritual stability and strength by suitable instruction and exhortation. I'm really pretty impressed that they understood to include the exhortation to that. Um, but look, the, and, and so, the, and by the way, the, so the, the, when we're looking at these words of edify, most of those definitions, remember, that comes, that comes from a root word, edifice, which is a building. But you understand that most of the most of the definitions for edif uh, edify and edification are not physical in nature. There is such a thing as an edifice, but most of these things are um, the uh, like Linda said a while ago, the building up of the soul, or like the definition said, the imparting of some kind of moral or spiritual stability or, or strengthening uh, of some kind. And so, not all edification, only, the only thing I'm pointing out is, don't get to thinking that the only edification that ever happens for someone is spiritual in nature, or that edif uh, edification is only physical in nature. It, it, but the only edifying, the only edification that results in godliness is by the doctrine. So you can encourage someone without the doctrine, but it only does that. The doctrine, however, is what makes the, that difference there. And so from that, this point forward, this is the kind of edification that Paul is talking about. It's what we're going to be talking about. I just don't want, the only thing, I didn't realize this is going to turn into a thing. Uh, the only, the only, uh, uh, point that I wanted to make in this is uh, it is possible for someone to benefit in their soul by someone coming along and encouraging them in some way.
but that doesn't produce godliness only the doctrine produces godliness and so let me give you a scripture for this first timothy chapter 1 verse 4 neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith so do i know i didn't give you the context for first timothy chapter 4 but Paul is actually warning Timothy about some things that are going to distract from the job that he's supposed to be doing. Timothy's a pastor. And because of that, uh, Paul wants to make sure that he keeps his eye on the prize, so to speak. And so what happens lots of times is, now he says, neither give heed to neither. In other words, he's already gone through a list of things that are going to kind of get the church off track. So he says, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies you know what that is that's that's all the things that people kind of come up with that everybody gets so wrapped up in but it's not godly edifying and that's why paul ends this thing it says rather than godly edifying in other words everything that we're doing here should be pointing to that end and so paul is saying and he says so do he's like hey get just make sure you don't get sidetracked with all this other stuff sometimes there's an interesting point to make and it may even be helpful to know it but if you get bogged down in all of those kinds of things you'll never get edifying and um and and so that's what uh, paul is after um edification is the common denominator between the gifts when they were in operation and the offices after those gifts were done away with and and um and and so now take a look with me Romans chapter 12 and verse 6 so let's pick this up having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us rather prophecy let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith now back to your note taker here on that figure one the gifts and offices the spiritual gift of a prophet talking about that supernatural gift at the beginning of the dispensation of grace included the ability to speak the word of God and that was given to the uh, the prophet the one that had the supernatural gift of a prophet he was given the ability to speak that word and it was the spirit that did that of course and that makes sense that the Spirit would have to do that because Paul hasn't written those, all those epistles yet that pertain to the body of Christ. So in order for edification to take place, this is, uh, this is the, the process that uh, God is going to use to present that word because it is always the word that God is using to edify us. And so when the supernatural gifts stop, God is no longer, by the way, all of those books that needed to get written, remember after the death of Jesus and then uh, Paul is intercepted, there's a whole bunch of books that are going to get written. Not only Paul's 13 epistles, but you're going to have all the books of Hebrews to Revelation. You're going to have the four Gospels. You're going to have the book of Acts. All of that is going to get written over there. But listen, once, once those gifts have ceased... You understand, God is no longer inspiring people with new scripture. I know there are places today that actually, you know, supposedly get this, you know, new revelation. Not according to Paul. And so for now, here's what we have. Back to your note taker. We have the written word. And so we can have confidence that we have everything that we need. It is perfect and not in part in the sense that it is the completion of the scriptures so the spiritual gifts that pertain to that are no longer needed and so let me show you this in part play look with me in first corinthians 13 8 charity never faileth but rather there'll be prophecies they shall fail rather there'll be tongues they shall cease rather they be knowledge it shall vanish away before we read the next verse let me just say those, he's not just saying those are the only three that are going to vanish away. Those, all, those three gifts there at verse 8 are uh, gifts that represent categories within the spiritual gifts. And so all three of those categories are eventually going to be done away with. 
Now verse, uh, uh, verse 9. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. And the scriptures are completed with the writing of the book of 2 Timothy. So no more need for a prophet to operate in that capacity. Now we have everything. We don't have just the in part. We have the complete. We have the perfect uh, word of God. And everything that God intended to give us, we have in his word. And so God's not revealing that new scripture to anyone else. He's not giving men extra biblical revelation. And um, I, I think everybody in this room and I think everybody on Zoom kind of understands that. But look, uh, th there is no. And so in light of what I'm saying to you. In the definition of what is being we've been talking about here. There are no prophets today. So I want everybody to understand that there are no prophets. I know there have been some men in the past. What well-meaning. But God is not inspiring men in order to reveal his truths. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul was talking to those that had the spiritual gifts operating them. And he says this, of all the gifts, desire that ye may prophesy. That ought to be the one that you would want, although the Spirit was the one giving those out. And, and let me just show you that verse, 1 Corinthians 14, 1. Follow after charity... And desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. And why did Paul put so much emphasis upon that gift? Because of what the gift was supposed to do. Because that was the gift that lent itself to the edification of the body. And that was what all, that's what, that's what God really wanted done with those folks. And that came under, in those days, the gift of the prophet. So back to your note taker. So that the, uh, the, the gift, the, the office of that was uh, that of a prophet. And um, it, it is short-sighted, folks, to think that the only definition for a prophet is to foretell the future. And that's the way a lot of people look at that. And the Old Testament prophets sometimes were given to see future events. But the word prophecy is not limited to that. And the reason I want to bring this up is because when you look at that word, and yes, the prophecy aspect of that was part of what the supernatural gift of a prophet had. But when you come to an office, what, does, what is that? Does that mean now whoever has that office has a supernatural ability to do that? No, because there are no more prophets. And, the, and, and by the way, those guys at the beginning of the dispensation of grace weren't always, pre, they weren't predicting the future. I've already given it to you. They were speaking the word of God out of that office. That's what that was about. And so um, let me just show you this in the, in, the, in the Oxford English Dictionary once again. Just look with me through these definitions. When, because remember what 1 Corinthians 14, 3 says. Uh, you know what? Did I miss that? I don't think so. But he that prophesieth, oh, I'm sorry. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. Guess what's not in there? For telling the future. See, the gift of the prophet was to speak to them so that their souls would be edified, so their souls would be built up. Now let's look at that definition. So the number one definition for prophesy is to speak by divine inspiration or in the name of a deity to speak as a prophet. Well, wait a minute. If a prophet is going to speak by divine inspiration, it means God is now giving him exactly. What, well, that's what was happening with the supernatural gift of a prophet when he spoke that word. But that is not happening today. I'm reminded of the little boy that came into his father who was pastor of a church comes into his dad's office he says dad does God tell you what to say when you're preaching and he goes yeah I guess he does and he said so on your notes how come you got so much marked out okay that didn't mean anything to you did it <laughs> okay but but look there is no 
if I'm sitting in my office during the week and 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 work, this is it's not about God divinely giving me what to say. That gift of a prophet, God's not inspiring anyone to do that anymore. Take a look at this next definition. To utter predictions. Now, this is the B. See, the A, 1A is to speak by divine inspiration. 1B is to utter predictions to foretell future events. 1C, in the apostolic churches, to interpret or expound the scriptures. I don't know why there's so many R's in that. I just saw that in the, on the, the thing here. Uh, expound the scriptures to utter divine mysteries and edifying communications as moved by the Holy Spirit. And so the, uh, the, those, those are the things that incorporate all that was with regard to a prophet. Those prophets, though, in the beginning of the dispensation of grace, were given that, uh, that, uh, that gift of being a prophet. And so what? And so now I want us to look at the word prophet for a moment because we saw prophesy. By the way, when you look at those definitions, here's what you know. I'm not speaking by divine inspiration. I'm not uttering predictions. Is it possible for me to interpret and expound the scriptures? Or to give edifying communications? Yes. So... But not the others. Okay. So it's not a prophet. I don't, I don't meet most of those criteria. So my office is not that of a prophet. My office is that of a pastor or a bishop. And that, that last one, that's exactly what's in the scripture uh, when it comes to giving you a job description for a bishop. Now let's take a look at the word prophet. One who speaks for God or for any deity as the inspired revealer or interpreter of his will one who is held or more loosely who claims to have this function as inspired or quasi inspired teacher what do you know why they included that last part there this is great in the definition it's a, okay so let's just take it take it a little piece at a time we'll have a little fun with this one who speaks for god or for any deity as the inspired revealer or interpreter of his will that's what every, all those guys that are off in the call, that's what they want to do. They are the only one that gets God's will, and they'll tell the people. Now, for an Old Testament prophet, that's what they did, didn't it? That's what they really did. It says, one who is held, or more loosely, who claims to have this function. Let me ask you a question. In your Bible, there's a bunch of false gods. Baal, Ashtaroth, Molech. Where does Molech live? <laughs> Where is Ashtaroth? Anyone ever seen Baal? What, what is the problem? What, what are all of those false gods, what do they all have in common? Right, they don't exist. They're not real gods. But a guy who is a prophet, and the Bible calls him this. Remember? The prophets of Baal. Well, were they really inspired revealers of Baal's will? No. What, 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 what were they really? They claimed to be the divine inspired revealer of this God's will. But if there's no God, really, then there's no revelation. So when they gave this definition, they were talking about those who claimed to be that way. And so those at the beginning of the dispensation of grace, they really did function uh, as prophets. Um, and um, the declaration of God's word was uh, supernaturally committed to them, and they were inspired to give it. Now let's talk about the next one. Let's talk about preachers versus prophets. And as I said earlier, there are some well-meaning people who have thought that as a pastor or a preacher that they somehow occupied that office of prophet today. And um, they don't claim, many of them don't claim to foretell future events, 
but uh, they do proclaim God's word. And, uh, and because they proclaim God's word, they think that makes them prophets. Pastors do present the word. They do preach the word. They do teach the word. They do defend the word. But that doesn't make them prophets in the biblical sense of the word. You know why? Because there's an ingredient that's, that's missing. And that is divinely inspired. That's the, ingre- that's, that's the critical ingredient for a prophet. And I would never stand up here and tell you that I am divinely inspired to do any of this. That is not uh, the case. However, back to your note taker, there are pastors and bishops. And their offices require them to do the very things. Preach the word, reprove, rebuke, exhort. Remember all that stuff? They're not prophets because they are not divinely inspired in any of those tasks. As I preach, I'm not divinely inspired. As I exhort you, I want those exhortations to be carefully crafted so that you benefit by them. But that doesn't mean I'm inspired. I'm certainly not inspired to teach this word. I'm not inspired to defend. God's not giving me all of that. And so the office of a prophet demands that someone be divinely inspired and I, um, I don't have that, and I don't claim to have that. And so, um, in the same way, God is not continuing to do that, even to make people godly. Do you hear that? Even, there is no inspiration and even when we're attempting to edify the saints, there's no divine inspiration taking place with that. Um, but God has chosen by His Word to accomplish that edification process, to accomplish His purpose and His will in our lives. And, and that may seem like a step backward from divine inspiration, but really, you know what this, what this does? is this allows everyone, everyone, from the, from the bishop down, I'm just, I, I don't mean everybody's not a, you know, somehow the lesser saint when I say that, but I mean from, from, from the leadership all the way down, that process has to be taken by everybody. And, that, and that's an important, that I think is a key and important thing, that, and we're going to have to take a look at that in just a little bit of the detail. Um, the prophets of old, folks, only knew what they were told. There was no, look, I know this is going to sound, um, um, this is going to sound strange. We look at the Old Testament prophets and we think, what a great thing to get this divine revelation from God and then to give it. Well, it depends because the people weren't always very receptive and sometimes you were taking your life in your hands when you did that. So it wasn't all just roses. But you say, well, why, why would God not divinely give that revelation anymore and choose to do it in, in this way? And here's the difference. A prophet only knew what was told to him, and that was that. What God is doing is allowing us as his sons and daughters to be able to think like him and deduce things that we are not told that are perfectly in line with his will and with his thinking. Okay, let me say it this way. The prophet is a bit is a little bit like a horse that has a bit and a bridle. How do you steer a horse? With those reins. And the horse just goes where he's told. But God doesn't want that. He wants sons and daughters who are able to think like he does for themselves and apply that to a lot of different situations in their life And truly become godly. All right, let me say it another way. God doesn't want a robot. God doesn't want a robot 
that only does what he is, you know, programmed to do. God wants a real relationship with sons and daughters who are able to act on their own as part of a body to accomplish his will exactly the way he would want it. That is far better. All right, let me do it another way. Here's a guy that gets a job. When he comes in, he hires on, and here's a company, got a big warehouse, things are going on, and he says, here's your job. We want you to um, clean the warehouse, and uh, here, here, here's what you'll do. And then you can do that, then you know what? After lunch, you can clean the break room, and then after that, you can and they kind of line him out. But you know what? If the guy is doing, when, when the guy comes in, you can, you know, the first few days, he does something, and then he goes to his boss, and he says, okay, what do I do now? And the boss gives him some direction. But what, what are you thinking two years later when the guy is coming to work, and after he completes his job, he goes to his boss and goes, what do I do now? Do you know what his boss is really hoping would eventually happen with this employee? He would kind of take everything that he's been through so far and look around and determine that which he should do. That's what God, that's why we're adult sons and daughters. God doesn't, it's, it's not that he can't tell you everything. But he's designed this so that it is beyond that. And you know what? The supernatural gifts, as good as they were to, to, to helping get folks edified until the word was complete, they couldn't produce that. You were just limited to just what you were given, and there wasn't any going anywhere with that. And now God has put a system into place where we have the ability to think like our Father and apply that thinking in a lot of different ways. And he is counting on that. Now, on this word prophets, I do want to say that this word gets bandied about a lot. And I just wanted to mention it just, a, just in, in a couple of different ways. Um, there's a grade of ministers in the Catholic Church who are called prophets. Uh, it's just the, the title that is given to this group. It lends some credibility in the eyes of the practitioners of Catholicism. Uh, but these men bear no real status as prophets um, to the true and living God. There are also those who practice Islam, and they have a saying. You've heard it. There is no God but Allah. Muhammad is his prophet. Well... Muhammad is the prophet of Allah in the same sense that there were prophets of Baal in Old Testament times. They all claimed to be inspired spokesmen of their particular God, and by definition, that made them prophets. But because they were not prophets of the true and living God, the Bible would call them false prophets. Today, in the dispensation of grace, the office of the bishop is charged with proclaiming God's word, but he is not a prophet. He is to prophesy in the sense of preaching that word, but he is not inspired, and he carries no extra biblical revelation. Now, let's talk about the operation of God for a moment. The operation that God wants accomplished in the dispensation of grace, he wants that word to be proclaimed. And not just proclaimed, but he wants that word proclaimed in its rightly divided form. So that we really do see this word the way it was supposed to be applied. And that is all done to the edification of the saints. The particular way that a bishop discharges his measure of faith, or the way he's going to labor with his father, is to speak for the Lord to the edification of the other members of the assembly of which he's a part. Now, he's not supposed to do this just any old way. He's supposed to preach the word with appropriate attention and application to that part that applies specifically to the members of the body of Christ who are living today in the dispensation of Gentile grace. And as the doctoral directive of Romans 12, 6 says, let me put it back up for you, he is supposed to, oh, 
I got I, I missed that verse unless I have it after I guess I missed it so let me just read it to you if you know what it is let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith so what does it mean to prophesy according to the proportion of faith if you don't have a if you have a supernatural gift we kind of know what that is um, and, and so let's just look at that definition the proportion a portion or part in its relation to the whole a comparative part a share sometimes simply a portion a division or part so when it says let us those with the supernatural gift let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith you know what that's saying only say that part that portion that was revealed to you that's all that means so if you had the supernatural gift and you were going to prophesy, then you just do the, as we're talking about here, that part or that portion that was revealed. Now, it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? So on your note taker, here it is. It would mean that he should only proclaim that part which is given by the Spirit. That's what the proportion of faith was with regard to the, the, the prophet with the supernatural gift. Resist the urge to include anything more. Don't offer his opinion. He would only speak that word. And that directive would also mean resisting the temptation to go beyond his own gift. He's not the exhorter and he's not the teacher. We've covered that in time past. The, but these were separate gifts that were meant to work in harmony with one another. Now, back to Romans chapter 12, verse 6. And then having then gifts differing according to the grace that's given to us, rather prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. And now what we want to do is look at the proportion of faith for a pastor. So he's not give, given anything supernaturally. What is the proportion of faith to him? Well, it means that each bishop is to proclaim and teach, which is what prophesy is. For the guy with the gift, it would be what was given to him by the Spirit. For the bishop, it would be that which is written already in the Word, right? And so, it means he would proclaim and teach that part that part or that portion of the word that is all that is working in him in other words if that isn't working in him that shouldn't be what he's talking about look if the scripture wasn't revealed to the guy with the gift he shouldn't be talking about it and if this isn't this is the, and so the proportion of faith for him is what did the spirit give you the proportion of faith for the bishop is what has the Spirit worked in you? And so if it has worked in him, then that would be something that he would certainly want to teach and exhort in connection to. And so the pastor would only prophesy about those things that he had an understanding of so that he could help the members of the assembly by answering their questions and talking about the effectual working of that portion of the Word. So the directive here is... He would present only the portion of the word to which he has attained in his own understanding and practice. In other words, if that portion of the word has not been edifying to him, then that should not be the portion of the word that he is presenting to his assembly. The proportion of faith is not about how much faith he has. It's not about how much faith God has given him. But we understand faith this way in the sense that we have seen it so many other times before. The proportion of faith for a pastor today is that portion of Scripture which he has faithfully responded to in his own life. That will, of course, continue to grow as he grows in grace. So that proportion of faith is that 
part that he has been entrusted with, that he has responded to. And so let me give you a verse on this so that you understand this is not talking about does the pastor have faith? It's not talking about faith in that way. It's talking about to the portion of the scripture he has been faithful to. So take a look. Galatians 3.22. But the scripture hath concluded all understand that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. What was the, what, what was the prompt? I'm, I'm not saying what was the promise. I'm saying what does it mean when it's, says by faith of Jesus Christ in other words the Lord was he faithfully performed that which was his to accomplish so that we would get this benefit if he hadn't done that if he had not faithfully responded to that which he had to do we would not have received that benefit there's a bunch of other scriptures in your notes I give you some other references and you can go look at them it's the same thing now I'm talking about faith in the same way the bishop can can only he the, what he should be preaching and exhorting and teaching and all of that is that portion of the scripture which he has faithfully responded to. That's the proportion of faith. So he must proclaim the word. He must be apt to teach it, and uh, and then he's also told to exhort in connection with it. So let me give you these verses. This is. Um, Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 12. In whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. That's just another example of that. And now uh, the exhort part. We're supposed to teach and exhort and all that. So 1 Timothy 6, 2. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they're brethren, but rather do them service because they're faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort so there's those two together first uh second timothy 4 2 preach the word be instant in season out of season reprove rebuke exhort with all long suffering and doctrine that falls under the purview of the bishop titus 1 9 holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers so there's two different things going on there the first thing is to exhort those who are receiving that word and convince the gainsayers. What's a gainsayer? A gainsayer is just a guy that wants to contradict the things that he's saying. So when you talk about the only thing that uh, edifies us unto God in us would be uh, the word of God, someone could contradict that and say, no, I don't, I don't think that. I think... I think you can get uh, you can become godly in another way too. That's a gainsayer, and so part of that job is to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. One more, and that's Titus two fifteen. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Now, as you can see, what is in the office of the bishop are all of those supernatural gifts rolled into one. They're not not supernatural but you understand what i'm saying you had one that would speak the word you had one that would exhort you had one that would teach yet th those kinds of things this is all rolled together within the office of the bishop and just as the prophet with the supernatural gift was to combine himself to the functions of his gift and not attempt to add to it the bishop is to proclaim i believe the word of the lord unmixed with the wisdom of men and the wisdom of this world So it means that's what we do. We preach the word and that's it. Now I've used this. I've used uh, we, we did some of this the last time and now we finished it up this time as far as looking at those three. I've left one out though in that list. If anybody looked at that list and said, you know, he that prophesy, let him prophesy according to the proportion of faith. There's one that comes after that. I skipped that one, but then he talks about he that teacheth, he that exhorteth. Those are the three that are kind of rolled together for the bishop. Now, we come to a very important part. All the folks on Zoom, this is where you wake back up. 
And listen to this carefully. Because now what we are on the very edge of is an opportunity for you, no matter who you are, an opportunity for you to engage in the edification of the saints through this one. That's the one that we're going to begin talking about next week. And here's why this is important. From this point forward, look, I, I took time to talk about the role of a pastor and, and separating it from that of a prophet so that everybody would clearly understand that. Now what I want to do is I am going to start going through those offices now that anyone might be able to participate in. And if you're going to be a, a functioning part of an assembly, which it is, it is my sincere desire that we will, and, I, and, 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 in, and in a big way, this is already being done in, in, in a lot of different ways. But now I'm going to be talking about an opportunity for not just the folks here, right, not just the folks here, but for the folks in Zoom to really now begin to fill an office and to be a functioning part of a body so that we are able to become the pillar and ground of truth that we have been designed to be. So we're not going to come back and revisit. You've gotten plenty of material on the edification office of the bishop. Now we're going to move to the next thing. And, and this is where I think it's going to get pretty exciting for us. So um, we'll stop here. And this will be the end of session 5B.